So hello everybody and welcome to the very first episode of ML Papers. This is a, a campaign in collaboration with the uh, Google Developers team for making uh, machine learning research let's say more accessible to everybody. And when I say accessible, I mean not just the resources, but also the, you know, the methods by which you go about learning about machine learning and conducting research in machine learning. Okay, now let me jump into the slides to tell you more. First, uh, let me tell you what we were covering. I'll give you a quick, uh, you know, overview of what this campaign is about, what you should expect uh, in this episode, the subsequent episodes, and after the live episodes. Because for each episode, there will be two things you want to consider. The live sessions, which of course will be recorded for you to watch later, but additional reading that you'll have to do outside of the live sessions. As you can imagine, Machine learning is, uh, it's an advanced uh, field and especially very mathematical. So while well, I'll take you through the paper that we're gonna cover today, uh, you should expect to have to read through mathematics. Now, this is our first paper. What I'm about to say is true for all the other papers that we will cover in this uh, in this series of episodes. And that is the all require substantial mathematical uh, readiness. Which is why we cannot cover all of the mathematical prerequisites in, a, in one session. Whether it's an hour session or even three hours, you will need more. So the way we will approach each episode is this. During the live sessions, I would give you a conceptual introduction to the paper. And then there is a place you will go to. I'll talk about that later, right? It's a website, it's a dashboard that you know we've developed a big number. Where you could go and take your time in a very self-paced fashion, read through the mathematical tutorial. Okay, I'll talk about that uh, momentarily. Okay, so first of all, what is this, uh, you know, uh, campaign about? Well, we were fortunate enough to be welcomed to the Google ML ecosystem. Uh, they reached out, they said, you know, we can see you're doing meetups very frequently on machine learning, on mathematics. Uh, why don't you join this campaign where we want to encourage people to read machine learning papers, and not just uh, any machine learning paper, but a, a selection of machine learning papers that are very influential. And you know, if you want to be very good at machine learning, you'd want to know what these uh, papers are about, the concepts that they talk about. And here is a table where you will see the papers that they want us to go through in, in, in what particular sequence. So for example, this is the first week, the first episode, where we'll cover the paper Zero Shot Learning Through Cross-Modal Transfer. That's a mouthful, but I'll tell you what these words mean. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, there will be two parts. The live sessions where it's mostly conceptual, very little to no mathematics. And then, of course, you'd have to see the mathematics. You'd have to uh, look through the reading material and actually uh, you know, read the mathematics. So um, we, since uh, you know we have multiple uh, things going on at big number, it might not happen every week, but uh, I'll try to make it at least two or three weeks. Every two or three three weeks, we can go through all of this, uh, all of these papers. So again, the idea here is that if you want to stay ahead of the curve, and if you want to be well versed in machine learning, it is important that we cover all of these. Uh, well, highly cited and very influential papers. 
Okay. And we'll start with the first one today, which is zero shot learning through cross model transfer. This all this uh, first episode also will serve as uh, a guide to learning independently, learning the uh, learning to how to read these papers, how to take notes when you're reading through them. Again, because of the mathematical content, uh, you can't just glance at the paper and you know just absorb the material. You have to actually take notes and be methodical with how you read these papers. So we'll look at that as well. Okay. Now, what is this paper about? Zero model, uh, zero shot learning through cross model transfer. Let's first begin by talking about machine learning at the very, very high level. So we, at least we have some context. We know that the purpose of a machine learning model is to learn. Learn to predict something. That something could be a range of numbers, like in regression. That something could be a class, like in classification. Or that something could also be a cluster, like in unsupervised learning. Okay? But for the model to be able to predict these things, in order for it to predict a range of numbers or classes or clusters, and let me actually take a step back. Let's exclude unsupervised learning for the moment. And let's just use uh, supervised learning as our starting point. In order for us to be able to predict anything in supervised learning, we need to have access to training data. So in order for the model to be able to identify a cat or a truck or a dog or what have you, it must have seen, right, seen examples of such things. Okay, so unless it has been exposed to pictures of trucks, pictures of animals, it will not be able to predict them. The problem is we don't always have the data that we need. And there's a finite number of uh, data we can always acquire, but there are infinite permutations for even uh, a specific type of data. So, for example, you know there are infinitely ways, infinitely many ways you can take pictures of, uh, of dogs, close-up pictures, pictures taken from afar, from different angles, and the animal could be centered in different places. But there are also objects that we cannot take into account. I'll give you a simple example. Let's say hypothetically that we have trained a model that can only predict the following items: trucks ships, dogs, horses, and let's throw in one more, uh, a bus. Just these five classes. So as long as the picture that you present to the model falls under one of these classes, then the model can do, you know, to tell you what it is. But what if we were to present to it a picture of something it has not seen before, like a cat? And let's say, hypothetically, we do not have training data for cats. But we still want the model to be able to predict it. How do we go about this? This is an example of zero-shot learning. Zero-shot, because the model never had a chance to look at it before. So it is learning for the first time. So zero-shot. Okay, so that's the first part of the, that explains the name of this paper. That is the motiv motivation. To come up with some sort of machine learning model that is able to classify a picture even though it has not seen it before. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Now, something that we will be referring to uh, a great deal in this episode, both the recorded session and the reading material, is the concept of a distribution. I'm hoping you all are familiar with types of distributions like frequency distributions, probability distributions. Generally, and in most cases, a machine learning model, uh, for lack of better words, perceives data in the form of a distribution. 
Whether it's text, it will be in the form of a distribution. Whether it's a picture, it will be in the form of a distribution. And let me give an example of a distribution. Okay? Uh, here we have a plot. On the x-axis, we have the income for 2,000 people. So on the x-axis, we have how much they earn. And on the y-axis, we have the frequency of the people. Now, how many people uh, make money you know, in this given range? And you can see that this distribution is skewed left. So it's, it, the tail is going towards the left. So people here are, uh, you know, have higher income, relatively speaking, right? You can see here that the average is somewhere between 250 to 500 K. So this could be like, you know, four, 450, 470 K. Okay, so this could be a sample of people who work uh, in, I don't know, hedge funds or they are investors, right? They have additional capital that they can put into different stocks, okay? Because as we know, uh, per perhaps the most powerful way to generate wealth is by investing it. Let's look at another distribution, and this is, uh, here's another example. This is very skewed to the right. And you can see... We have a uh, this peak towards the very left of this plot, and this could be a sample of people you know who work in public transportation. Okay, so typically they low earn on the lower side. Uh, yes, they they earn they, they're uh, on the lower side of the of uh, of their earnings of the earnings. But my point is this. Uh, no matter what type of modal, a modal is a type of uh, is is a is a is a is a an object of perception. So it could be pictures, it could be text, it could be sound bites, right? For them, we have these different senses, but the model, machine learning models, can only perceive through distributions. So if you have a picture, you must turn it to a distribution. If you have text, you must turn it to a distribution. If you have sound bites. Turn it to distribution. Distribution. Okay. So let's keep this idea in mind. When I when you heard the word distribution, this is what what I want you to imagine. So th things like this. All right. Now, I just alluded to the word modal, but this is what modal he refers to, right? Different ways um, of you know uh, perceiving. So just like we humans can hear things and see things and verbally express or uh, uh, write things, uh, we want machine learning model to be able to do the same thing. So an image is one modal, a text is one modal, a so is a sound bite. Now, in this particular paper, we are concerned with images and text. This is where the other part of the word, the other part of the title comes in, cross modality. If you remember, we said that we are talking about a situation where we want to predict the class of a picture when we have not seen the picture before, when the model has never seen the pictures before. How do we do it? Well, we could if we have text information. So we may not, we may not have pictures of that thing, but we may have texts of that thing. We may have you know writings about that word descriptions of that so even if you don't have the picture of a cat we have you know descriptions of it you know it has ears it has whiskers it has a nose stripes that kind of thing what we want to do or what this paper is about is uh, projecting the picture into something called a semantic space projecting the picture that the model has not seen before into a semantic space and we'll see what, what's going what's going to happen but i'm Trying to give you a background, right? To explain where this name comes from. So, zero shot, learning through cross modal transfer. Again, so mouth, uh, it's a mouthful. And sometimes I have to remember to the, the combination of words. But that's the idea. When we don't have any images, maybe we can associate uh, the picture with words that we have seen before. Or words we have, yeah, the, mo the words that the model has uh, been exposed to before. So here is a, <clears throat> let me give you some background into both 
uh, elementary natural language processing and then very elementary computer vision. Again, these are two very big fields. So we can't cover these uh, concepts in great detail, but I'll try to cover as much as we can so that we can at least understand what this paper is trying to communicate to us. <clears throat> now, th there's a lot going on in this picture, so let's uh, focus first here on these words. We have the words dog, puppy, cat, and houses. And what you're looking at, these sequence of numbers, this is what we call a vector, a word vector. What do these numbers represent? They represent the probability that this word belongs to a particular topic. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say we have a corpora. That's a te technical word. A corpora is a collection of documents. Documents could be articles, blogs, books, even something as brief as a tweet. Okay? So, for example, if you were to take all of the tweets in Twitter, every person's tweet, each tweet would be a document, and the collection of all those tweets we will call the corpora. Or if you take Google, for example, right? Every single web page would be a document, and the collection of all of these web pages would be the corpora. Okay, let's imagine we have a corpora of uh, some articles. And every single article would fall into one of five categories. It could be about uh, animals, biological creatures, automobiles, uh, buildings, and the fifth one could be, uh, I don't know, flowers, for example. Okay, so we our, our system has only learned about five topics. So whatever word it encounters must fall into one of these uh, topics. Now, it's not mutually ex exclusive. So, for example, the word dog could belong to multiple topics, but it is more relevant in some contexts than others. Okay, so for example, let's say you have an article that talks about uh, guard dogs in front of a building. Okay, so the article is not about dogs, it just refers to dogs. So, for example, if we were to look at its relevance for document three, where document three is about buildings, it will be 0 0.1 as an example. Okay, whereas when it comes to, uh, let's say, the topic of animals, it will be 0 0.9. And for context, if something is irrelevant, it will be, it would converge towards negative one. So it will be uh, irrelevant, and if it's uh, very rel relevant, it will converge to 1. Okay, so you can see this is quite close to 1. So for topic 2, which has to do with animals, it is very relevant for biological uh, creatures. It's also high, but you know not as high as uh, you know when it, the topic of animals. And when it comes to, I said D3, okay, let's make D5. When it comes to buildings, or actually let's make it about cars, right? It is practically irrelevant. Car they have nothing to do with each other. Like, they don't even appear as much in literature. Okay? So, if we look at the uh, distribution, let's say the topic distribution for the word puppy, it has similar distribution, right? So this is 0 0.6, this is 0 0.5. For, for the second topic, it's 0 0.9, here it's 0 0.8. And similar thing for cat. Now I got the numbers wrong, but at least let's focus on the first, uh, the first numbers in each vector. Okay, I was just giving you uh, uh, an example. I just grabbed this picture from Google, so I'm not even sure what D1 did D stands for, but nonetheless, the idea is still relevant. So you can see dog, puppy, and cat. When it comes to the first topic, let's say it has to do with animals, they both rank highly. But for example, the word house is negative eight. It has nothing to do with animals. So, this is the distribution for these five words. And then we can plot these words on a graph. So, this is the vector for house, houses, 
And these are the vectors for d puppy, dog, and cat. Now, there is something called cosine similarity, which you may have heard of. If not, that's fine. I'll, later on, I'm going to switch to the uh, iPad to do some drawing. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that word. But there is a way we can determine how these vectors are similar to each other, like in their content, in their distribution. So these three words are very similar in the distribution, and there is a linear algebraic technique that we can calculate the similarity. And if they are similar, then we can group them together. This is, this is an important point, which we'll come back to in a moment. Okay. Now, this is called a dimension. Now, this is called a semantic space. So, again, uh, I'm not going to get into the math, how mathematically this is done. We, that will be a reading material, which you can check out later on. But uh, using these uh, uh, linear algebra techniques, we can figure out how similar these distributions are and then cluster them together, group them together. So here we have the words not good, dislike, incredible, bad, right? Words with negative sentiment. They are clustered together. And positive words like amazing, wonderful, fantastic. Similarly, they are clustered together. Okay? So keep this in mind. Because this is what we're going to come, this is what the paper refers to. We have a semantic space. We have different words, we know their meaning, and we know how they are associated together. This will help us, this foundation, this semantic space is going to help us take a picture that we have not seen before and then associate it with words. And then once we know what, that, what words that picture is associated with, we can find similar pictures and then associate a picture in one particular cluster with the picture that we have seen. And then, for example, we could figure out this cat is a dog. Now, I kind of went quickly with that, uh, but we're going to go deeper. We'll go deeper still. So let me take. Let me uh, come back a slide. Just keep this in mind that we have now a distribution for words. We want to produce something similar for pictures. The question in here from Ron: This this space appears to be based on bo both words and phrases. Correct. Well, the word vector, the way we can, the, way, the only way we can produce uh, distributions over words is if uh, we have seen them in context. So the reason we would know that dogs are related to animals, or they have, they have a high, they are highly correlated with animals, is because th th these words appear frequently in articles that talk about animals, like uh, animal, animal care, or pets, or that kind of thing. Now, like I said, this is in the realm of natural language processing, which is both computer vision and natural language processing are quite uh, big fields. And we have to cover some ground to even understand words like word embeddings. And uh, the word dimensionality reduction is not even, is not necessarily confined to NLP. It's a linear algebra technique. But uh, yeah, in order for us to know to what topics a particular word belongs, we, we need context. So we need to go through articles and articles and articles. Incredibly bad is a single vector, yes? Yes, so the word incredibly bad, we would consider one word. So even though it's separated by a space, as long as far as we're concerned, it's one word. And the same is true for uh, very good. Okay, computer vision. How do, how do computers see? Consider this picture. Can anyone guess whose picture this is? It's a very well-known silhouette. Uh, a picture, and let's start with, yes, it's Abraham Lincoln. A picture is a, uh, no, no, uh, uh, here's what I wanted to say, right? So uh, pictures come in color, but let's start with an example of a black and white picture, right? So we have one color channel. And you can see we have different in intensities of brightness. Okay, so these white pixels, you know, where the you know uh, 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 here at the, up at the forehead and the in the cheeks, these have high intensities. Okay, and for context, pixels range in numbers from zero to two five five. Two five five is a pick perfectly pixel white is a perfectly white pixel like my background, and zero would be perfectly black like you know my shirt. Okay, so all of these pixels here would be two five five. And all the pixels here would be 
zero. Everything else and everything else would be somewhere in between. So my face, for example, would be in the grays, like 100, 150. And that's uh, this picture is quite mm, low quality, but you get the idea, right? So what we will do, the way the, the machine learning perceives is by look, looking at these numbers, okay? We have a numerical representation for every pixel. The higher the number, the higher the intensity, the brightness. Of course, pictures come in colors. And you know that we can mix the three primary colors, red, green, and blue, to produce different shades of, to, to, to come up with different colors. Right, so blue and green would give you mix them together. You can get yellow, uh, blue and red. You can mix it to get purple, and you get the idea, right? Now I'm not going to get into convolutional networks and that kind of thing. But what we can do is we can again use linear algebra techniques to convert or go from or reshape to use the word reshape to reshape this tensor of matrices. So we have three matrices, right? We have three tabular representations one for each color channel, and then flatten them into a vector, right? We can take these rows and align them on one line, and then we have a vector. So once again, we have a distribution for a picture. We have distributions for words, like we saw in the previous slides. We have distributions for pictures, like we are seeing here, right? So 255 would be a, like a uh, highly intense red color. Whereas uh, here, 142 would be uh, medium intensity in the blue channel. But that's again how, this is the kind of data we'd be feeding to a model. All right? So distributions for any, for any type of modality. So always remember a vector of numbers because in a moment, I'm gonna switch to the iPad to tell you what this paper is talking about. Zero shot, meaning not having seen the picture before. So learning from uh, learning when it has not seen before through cross modal transfer, using words in place of pictures, in 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 place of uh, existing pictures. So this is the semantic space, but this is uh, there is a lot, there's some background that we need to cover. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the iPad now to give you again a high level overview and then but but I will talk about the mathematical syntax as well. The prerequisite by the way for this paper is both linear algebra and Bayesian probability. I'll tell you where to learn these. We have we have resources for that. But let's again start high level and then go deeper and deeper where necessary. Okay, let me now switch to the iPad. So we said that any type of modality must be represented as a distribution. I can see we have a fan of uh, concepts here. Very nice. Yeah, it's it's I I I really like it. Uh, it's, it has so many nice features. So we said that uh, any type of modality must be expressed in the form of a distribution. Now. Let's say we have some word. Let's say we have some word, which I will express using W. And I'm going to use the convention used in the paper. So W for word. And of course, in mathematics, there are two ways to express vectors, either making them bold, which I cannot do in writing, or by putting a an arrow like so, OK? So for example, this could be the word cat. And the word cat must fall under, it will have a, uh, it, will, it will be distributed across multiple topics, but it will, it will have a higher uh, correlation with animals and biological creatures. So I don't remember what the numbers were in the slides, but this could be like 0 0.6. Actually, let's make this dog because we said that we don't have examples for cats. 0 0.6, 0 0.9, let's make this 0 0.02. I'm just making up these numbers, okay? Uh, this would be 0 and then something, something, something. And then 0 point, let's make this 2, okay? This is the distribution for the word dog. And then there is the picture. 
of dog okay here the subscript d means it's, uh, it's for dog uh, but the base x is for picture okay now in practice the distribution these numbers wouldn't match exactly these numbers won't match exactly but uh, it helps for this example okay and then we have a coordinate system okay let me try again we have a coordinate system you know where you plot your your uh, points your on the x and y axis okay and let's say that this is the semantic space the word space by the way means point so for example um, let's say we take this point imagine this is the x-axis this is the y-axis okay then actually you know what maybe I should have used uh, x and y instead of drawing a box no problem I'll, I'll improvise here okay so we only have x and y okay this is your x-axis this is your y-axis if you pick on any uh, point if you pick any point okay so a space is a set of points x and y that's what that's how you get to this point you must know its location on the x-axis its location on the y-axis okay so we plot all of those words all of the words that we have in our uh, corpora right da, uh, cats planes trucks etc and i will use let's say the i'll use a rectangle to represent the word vector so if i if i look at the semantic space they had in the uh Just a moment. Okay, yes. I thought you could only see my iPad. If I show you the picture, this is that paper, by the way. Uh, I'll come to that manifold in a moment. Here, this one. Okay. So, in their semantic space, the word ship is the, sh the word ship vector. The word vector for ship is down here. Frog is up there. So you have a few. So let's try to create a simplified version of this. Okay so we have ship we have let's say one for truck we have one for dog and we have one for i think there was one for frog now let's just make one for i don't know airplane i'm making it up at making up things at this point so this would be truck This would be uh, a ship. Airplane. And then as we go towards the right, it becomes more about animals. So this would be a frog. And this would be a dog. This would be a dog. So these are wood vectors, right? So this would be W sub D. And this would be W sub A, or uppercase A if you want to be consistent with our convention. So they're vectors of distributions. Question. Is it safe to assume that in practice the semantic word space or word embeddings have a lot more than seven dimensions? Of course. In fact, uh, there is something called HTP which allows us to have potentially infinite number of topics so of course in practice you're going to have uh, more than just seven topics there's a library called gensem that you uh, by default uses 20 topics so there's something called latent Dirichlet allocation 
which allows you to choose the number of topics you want to over which you want to have a distribution. But there's a variant of it called HDP, which allows you to have infinite many, infinitely many uh, distributions. Okay, hypothetically. So of course, yes, in practice you would have seven. But again, I'm just we're trying to look at a very simplified example here. Okay. Then uh, there is a another model called TSNE, T distribution stochastic. I forgot the rest of the word. I'll come back to it in a minute. But uh, it allows us to produce this semantic space. Okay. Now, so the square, the rectangles they represent word vectors. Yes. The uh, Rectangles represent word vectors. And let's say for these word vectors, we also have pictures. So with these words, we have pictures associated with them. So I'll use a star here. A star will be a picture. Let me zoom in. Try again. So we have a few pictures of ships. One more time. Uh, why is it not letting me... One more time. See, concepts is great if you know how to use it properly. So let's bring this here. Okay. So we have a few pictures of ships. That's one picture. That's another picture. That's another picture, right? Different pictures of ships. Maybe we have some little boats. Some could be large ships, you know, like that big ship Evergreen that blocked the Suez Canal. So they come in different shapes and sizes. And then we have pictures of airplanes. Uh, pictures of dogs. They come in different breeds, right? And then we have a few pic couple of pictures of frogs. You get the idea, right? So in this semantic in this space, we have words and pictures associated with these words. Pictures associated with these words. All right. So these stars, for example, these stars these stars have similar distributions once again let's say when it comes to dogs let me i, I want to get rid of that uh, circle so we have three types of dogs right let's bring a copy here so dogs have very similar distributions maybe this could be 0. Point I don't know, seven, this could be eight. This would be 0 0.7, this would be 0 0.8, and this could be, you know, eight and eight, for example. Okay, so in this, for the first three uh, components, we have very similar ranges. So the distribution, you know, could like skewed right. Dogs have a uh, skewed, rightly skewed distribution okay maybe this could be uh, what are some breeds this could be golden shepherd uh, bulldog and what's another one what's another uh, dalmatian for example right they have they have similar features now the paper also talks about a manifold labrador exactly the paper also talks about something called a manifold a manifold is a, is a shape, also a set of points. So if I scroll, I think, up here, they talk about a manifold. So it, this is that drawing I just showed you on the iPad. But this line, this manifold that they call, is the set of data that they have seen. So word vectors that they have, and pictures of those things so these are all pictures of dogs these are all pictures of horses pictures of automobiles okay 
Now, here we're talking about classes of pictures. Okay, so this manifold encompasses classes of pictures. But we do have, we still have words for cats. Okay, so let me come back to the iPad. Okay, let's actually move this a little lower to make some room. Okay. So we also know what a cat is. We have we, we have we have a, a, a word vector for cat as well. So let me copy this. Well, we just have we don't have any pictures of it. We just don't have any pictures of it. You know, like uh, UFOs. There's so much literature about UFOs, but well, there are pictures of it. But uh, I guess those are made up pictures. L Loch Ness Monster, the Loch Ness Monster, which is very like uh, blurry or something. So there's a lot of talk about the monster, but not enough, no, no actual pictures of it. So this could be a cat. So let's say for us, for some reason, uh, we have not seen cats before. We have heard things about it, rumors and legends, but we don't, we don't have, a, we have not seen it. Okay, I'll have a look at the comment you just put here, Ron. So our manifold of images will be this. So it doesn't have to be a perfect shape. So we have pictures of all of these things. Okay. We have vectors for all other, for cats and uh, trucks and what have you, but we don't have pictures of them. Okay. Now suppose we are presented with a new picture. A picture of something we haven't seen before. And let me color this maybe, color give, give it a, or increase its density so it stands out. There we go. This is a picture of a cat. Okay. And we do not know it's, we do not know it's, uh, we do not know it's, uh, uh, picture distribution, we don't know it's image distribution, so, we have the following situation, right? So we have, uh, let me see if I remember what the paper said correctly. So we have W sub C and X sub C. Okay. So for the picture, we have I don't know, very similar to that of a dog, but not exactly. So 0 0.5, 0. Point, let's also make this 6, something, 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 and then 0 0.2 for some reason. Okay. We have this picture, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is yet. So it is in our semantic space, but since we haven't seen cats before, but we don't, we don't know that it is in fact a cat. Maybe it could be a plane for, for all we know, for all the model knows. So the paper talks about a uh, an, an optimization function. So let me come back here, scroll down. Down here, Do you, can, does anyone know what this is? This is something similar to the distance formula. So what the what the idea is this, right? We have this semantic space, and we have a picture of this cat. What we are going to do is the first thing we need to do is determine if this picture is inside the manifold or not. If it's not inside the manifold. If it is not inside the set of pictures that we have seen, we are going to compare this picture, the distribution of this picture with other pictures in the manifold, and see which to which picture is, is this distribution most closest. In your opinion, even though we haven't actually seen numbers uh, and we don't know what the space is, just practically speaking, to which of these uh, classes, do you think th this would have a similar distribution? Right? 
look here. We said that for dogs, it's uh, higher on this side. It's higher on this side, lower on that side. Okay. You have a similar thing here. It's higher on the left, lower on the right. Exactly, Ron. The distribution for this cat, uh, yeah, the distribution for this picture would be closest to the dog. Would be closest to the dog. Okay? But not exactly. But since we have a close neighbor, the word vector of for cat, then we can plot it here. And then this will become this word vector will become, well, the word associated with this picture. This is what this paper is about. This is uh, the idea. So even though we don't, we have not seen pictures of it before. We've we we have read about it, so to speak, and we can we can move this picture around the space to see what is its closest uh, neighbor or the the thing that is closest to it, and then. The word vector that is close to its position will become the word that is associated with the picture. This is zero shot learning through cross model transfer. So this, while we don't have pictures of it, we do have other models, modals, or however you want to pronounce it. This is cross modal learning. That's the idea. Okay. Now, uh, Ron asks, is this the mean square distance? This is the Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance formula, and I'll show a picture of it on Google Images. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, let's go a little deeper into the details. And let me also talk about our motivation for these papers, for our community. Uh, Ron asks, so the image of the never have been seen cat has a test description. It has, uh, I won't use the word description because that's not the word they're using, but it has a label now, okay? It has a label because we have it, we have a semantic space. And because the picture appeared in the, in the semantic space, space, because the picture appears close to a, a word that we already have, well now, that will be its class. It is now a cat because, uh, because of you know the technique we just talked about. Okay, let me come back to my uh, laptop here. Stop. This paper is actually not that lengthy. It is seven pages long. However, it has, it assumes a lot of familiarity with concepts. So it assumes that you know what distributions are. It assumes you know what zero shot means because we have zero shot learning we have one shot learning it assumes you know what modality means it un it assumes you know what embedding means i don't think we even talked about embedding just yet uh, but embedding is how you group words in some by some category so for example the word prince princess king uh, queen monarch these words would be associated with an umbrella term like royalty. The word, uh, the words, uh, let's say, uh, cat, dog, horse. What's another mammal? Bears. This would be these these words would be associated with uh, the word the the umbrella term of a, a animal. Okay, so that's an embedding. Now, how do you go about reading a paper like this? So first of all, uh, let me t let's talk about archive. And uh, why this resource versus others. First of all, archive is a, what's the word they use? Is a preprint database for papers. Preprint means if you're a researcher, you, you can submit optional you can submit or not submit you can submit your paper to archive and have it publicly available before it has even been peer reviewed right if a researcher wants to publish paper 
they have to wait uh, a long time before it actually gets published. And they also have to put more work into formatting it. Now, these are uh, still papers are in archive are quite high quality. Uh, like all of the papers that we talked about, they're highly cited and they are available freely on archive. But you're more likely to see uh, a new paper appear on archive first before it gets published on somewhere like Springer or IEEE. Now, archive is mostly mostly a repository for papers that are very mathematical in nature. So they have more papers on physics, followed by computer science, mathematics, and statistics. And as far as I'm as far as I know, there's not a single there's a negligible amount because they don't even make reference to it on like social sciences. I think economics is there, but that's that's about it. No, there's no psychology or medicine or anything like that. So archive is good if you're someone in computer science, mathematics, physics. Okay, you have a lot of research and they are free. So if you wanna have access to publications like Springer, you need to be uh, either associated with a university, like you must be a, like a grad student or something, or you must pay out of your pocket. And the subscriptions are quite expensive. Whereas archive is free, Every, anyone can, any, anyone can uh, access them. And you have a lot of high quality papers. And like I said, no, new ideas appear here more quickly than they would on these publications. And they are high quality. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve and you want to learn different machine learning concepts, this is the best place to go. Even more so than YouTube or Medium, and uh, and if if you've attended my workshops, you know that I have. I don't have a good op good opinion on, uh, you know, blogs and videos. Not because they are not good quality content, but they're also very poor quality. A lot of inaccurate information on these open platforms. Whereas the people who write these papers are, <laughs> as a black hole. It could be, right? You can end up in a black hole. I mean, you can go down this rabbit hole and just feed yourself and in, correct information, one video after the next. But anyway, uh, archive, you know, everyone here is a researcher, they're experts. Uh, you could even, you know, if you have a very good paper, you can also submit it here and it's free. The one thing that you need to do is prepare yourself for, or have some sort of strategy for reading these papers, which I'm going to talk about now, right now. Okay. So let's talk about LaTeX and Markdown. Quick question. How many of you are familiar with LaTeX? If you, ha if you have, if you have, um, I can see someone is raising their hand. If you want to speak, let me just make sure I can. If you want to speak, by the way, you can go ahead. But uh, if you... If you know LaTeX, meaning you, you know how to write LaTeX, you can write mathematical expression in LaTeX, type in Y, Y for yes. Otherwise, type in N for no. Let's do a quick survey. Okay, that's a lot of Ys. This is nice. Okay, and a couple of Ns just coming in. Okay, but most of you uh, know LaTeX, which is great. Then uh, you know, my, my work becomes easier. LaTeX, okay, Iran, you know, you know multiple formats. Amazing. Well, now most of you have uh, no LaTeX. Uh, what, what, am I, what am I going to talk about now? But uh, let me tell you uh, how, how I go about, how I went about reading this paper. And I really only had a few days to uh, read through this paper. So the first thing I like to do is get the mathematical expressions out of the way. Uh, what I do is I first start with the abstract to see what this paper is, and to see if it's interesting to me, if it's going to help me with my research. Now, I'm not researching anything in particular. I am just, uh, I, I'm going through this paper because it's influential and I'm part of this campaign that Google, that Google developers are running. But I would start with the abstract. And then I would, if I am doing research, I jump to the conclusion at the very end to see if they accomplished you know, the, what I'm trying to see, what I'm trying to do. So for example, one thing I'm trying to do is convert uh, pictures 
to LaTeX. And then, uh, sorry, for, uh, uh, convert pictures to distributions and those distributions I want to convert to LaTeX. Basically what I'm trying to do is scan uh, PDFs and have a LaTeX corpora. So I can, I have a app, I don't know how maybe how many, how many have seen called box map. It allows me to search for expressions. So basically if I'm looking, if I'm searching for some sort of math formula to know what it means, uh, I want to be able to do that without having to spend, you know, countless hours going through Google. Okay. Thank you, Annabelle, for coming. Okay, but uh, yeah, so I go from abstract to conclusion. And if it's something that I like, uh, that's when I open VS Code and I start writing down the math expressions. Comment from someone. Thank you for hosting. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, by the way, yes, this will be recorded. Uh, the link will be on YouTube. Okay. Actually, let me stop right here before I switch to the dashboard to tell you about the second part of this episode. Right, because like I said, there was a there's a lot of mathematics involved, and uh, part of this campaign is helping you to figure out how to, you know, go about learning the mathematics. This is a uh, this is the big number websites, the the big number website, the link for which is also included in the meetup uh, uh, at which you RSVP. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, if you go to this website you will find that there are right now three courses running. When you come back tomorrow, there will be a fourth course, which will, which will be completely open. Okay, all you have to do is sign up with your email and you have access to, to the dashboard. And the dashboard will look something like this. So what you would find on the dashboard is uh, you would have one module per paper. So right now, we, by the end, in, in 30 minutes, we would have finished the first paper, right? There will be a recording, which is this one, but then there will be supplementary material uh, in the form of PDF for you to read. There are a couple of mathematical concepts with which you must be familiar to successfully make sense of the ideas in this paper. If I focus on the mathematical parts, here we have the uh, Well, there is some set theory that's definitely covered already in, 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 the, in the dashboard. Then there is uh, the concept of an op optimization function, the Euclidean distance formula, projection. There's uh, projection is a very important part of this. Projection is, uh, you know, basically going from one vector to other vectors. That will be covered. So the linear algebra pre uh, prerequisites. Then if I scroll down, for, so for example, this is the, these two vertical bars. The, the, this is what we, what we call the norm of a norm of a cal calculating the norm, the magnitude. Th there's another, that's another word for it. If I scroll down here, oh, a big part of it is Bayesian probability, right? What is the probability of the class of that picture given its picture, given the set of seen uh, pictures? W W stands for I may I may have I have some notes here. W stands for I think, uh, but in, I, I, I've written it now. I'll come to them in a moment. But the idea is this: that you should be able to read these expressions as if they're English. So while I won't be able to cover them in the live sessions, I will give you reading material to for the linear ba algebra background, the probability theory background, and here's the best part. I'm sure you know that. The linear algebra, probability theory, uh, calculus, these are all prerequisites for anything to do with machine learning. So we're gonna go over these papers in the coming weeks. You might as well start your mathematical review or if this is all new to you, you, can, you might as well start your mathematical journey from, from now. Someone is raising their hands. By the way, if you have a question, you can go ahead and turn on your microphone. I'll just make sure I can hear you. Okay. I have a question. Oh yes, please go ahead. Um, so if I wanted to start my mathematical journey now, um, mm -hmm. you know, what would what's the the um suggested uh, path? Like, where do I go? From what subject up to to what? You know oh, what I mean? Oh, what an amazing question. 
Very good question. And I know the answer because I had to, uh, I brought this up with uh, Google uh, DevRels. I said, you know, papers like these require mathematical, mathematics. So they said, okay, how do you want to approach this? And I give them a list of topics we'll cover. And I remember it. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you that in a second. Um, but yes, let me just finish off and I'll come to your question. So if you want to be able to read this mathematics, first, you need to know what they are. But even if you know what they are, you must first write them down. So here's how I approach it, right? So the way I started reading this paper is this. Let me show you my comments, right? This is the markdown I prepared. It's not even complete, but you'll get the idea. So this code that you're seeing here is called LaTeX. Let me just show you what I have. Okay. So first I made a list of uh, the background. So the context of what this paper, like what, what problem is the paper trying to solve? Then highlights, like, well, what does it have? What, what, what is the, no, what's the novelty of this approach? Because there are different ways to uh, solve this. And this paper, by the way, is not the only paper on using cross modality for learning. Uh, and by the way, the author, one of the authors on this paper is uh, Andrew Ung. Uh, very, uh, for, for many, there's no need for introducing him. He's a professor of Stanford, founder of Coursera. So, you know, he's big when it you know, big uh, uh, personality in the field of deep learning. And also Christopher Manning. Uh, but yes, uh, the background, the highlights, and then I like to go through the glossary. So if, I, if there's any definition, like for example, objective function, right? Uh, I, I want to know what that word means before I go any further. So I, I, what I do is I highlight jargon. Objective function, there's the word embedding I told you about, TSNE. So for example, in the paper, they said we use, uh, we use TSNE for dimensionality reduction. I'm sure you've heard of different dimensional, dimensionality reduction techniques, like support vector machines, principal component analysis, support vector, uh, yes, uh, SVM, PCA. TSNE is yet another dimensionality reduction technique, but they don't talk about that. You would have to go to the bibliography to see which paper goes into TSNE in more detail. So I, I I keep a list of things. These are not, you cannot like read the paper and then be conscious about all of these different components. And then there is the mathematical prerequisites. Okay. Uh, here's what I like to do. I like to write down all of the expressions they used in their paper. So whenever I'm reading a different section of the paper, I just jump back to like this section and I can go, uh, X, oh, okay, that's a vector of images. And then, oh, V is a random variable. And then, oh, J sub theta, uh, J of theta is the uh, activation function. So it's much faster for me to have a glance at this than to keep on going back uh, and, you know, scrolling up and down to find the mathematical expression. Now, since most of you know LaTeX, uh, I guess it doesn't really help you for me to to teach you LaTeX, but uh, on the dashboard, there will be a glossary, or not a glossary, a reference table. So if you want to, for example, use the, I don't know, the in symbol or the real number symbol, what is the LaTeX code that you have to type? And since some of you said no, I just want to let you know that uh, you can find that resource, but it's really helpful to do this on markdown. You can you can like type very quickly. So you know the problem with doing this and by, by writing by hand is if you make a mistake in the expression, like you have to start from you have to start over. And sometimes your handwriting is not clear. It's just a lot easier to type it. And then you can copy paste it. You can add a few characters here and there. And the best part is you can turn this to PDF. Okay. So I'm going to skip the LaTeX interview, uh, the LaTeX tutorial, since most most of you are familiar with it. Now, to answer your question, who who was it who asked the question? Just if you can let me know your name in the chat. Ron Schneider says Boolean algebra. Well, well, I'll tell you where you want to start. Who was it who asked the question? Are you still here? Anyway, I'll go ahead and, it was a manual. Okay, manual. So here's, here's my answer, right? Does anyone know what's another name for machine learning? 
before machine learning was called machine learning, it had another name. In fact, one of the most prolific books on machine learning doesn't even have the word machine in it. Exactly, statistical learning. Statistical learning. And that's because uh, almost every concept in machine learning, and that includes neural networks, is a concept from statistics or a derivation of it. But it's actually more probability theory because statistics is more of a science than a mathematical branch. Statistics uses probability theory heavily. So to put it differently, you know, if you want to become a master of machine learning, then you must be a master or attempt to become a master of probability theory. Now, there are many books on probability theory, but these books assume that you, the reader, already have the prerequisites because probability theory has prerequisite. Uh, it, it has mathematical prerequisites. Probability theory requires knowledge of analysis, which is the umbrella term for all things calculus. Probability theory also deals with matrices. So one of its prerequisites is linear algebra. Linear algebra in turn is a branch of mathematics that has developed from abstract algebra. And abstract algebra in turn was a branch that developed because elementary algebra could not solve polynomials to the fifth degree and above. So that brings us to elementary algebra. This is something that is usually taught in high school, but if you're someone like me, you don't remember all the elementary algebra. I actually learned mathematics from scratch after I left high school, but that's a different topic, okay? There's more. So these are the prerequisites for linear algebra, right? Even very, like there are some very well-written books on linear algebra, but those books assume you know abstract algebra, and of course, abstract algebra in elementary algebra. Anyway, uh, what else? Discrete mathematics. Discrete mathematics is a subset of pure mathematics, but it excludes analysis. Uh, what's co covered in discrete mathematics? There is combinatorics. Very important if you want to read uh, any probability theory text. Uh, in fact, mm, first of all, discrete mathematics, as some of, I hope I think some of you know, is the most central topic in computer science. So if you want to be very good at data structures and algorithms, uh, as a software engineer or even a data engineer, right? You must know data structures very well. And the prerequisites for data structures are the following. So combinatorics is at the very top. Then we have graph theory. Then there is uh, set theory. There is propositional calculus. Now, don't be intimidated by the list I'm making. Bear with me. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to approach this. And uh, by the way, Ron, Boolean algebra is a subtype of propositional calculus. They have the same exact operators. So and, or, and, uh, yeah, Con uh, equivalence. The quantifiers, right? So whatever we have in Boolean algebra, we also have in, uh, what's it called? Proposition calculus. So I won't include Boolean algebra here. And then what else this, what's, what falls under discrete math? Proofs and mathematical induction. So, but proofs, no, proofs is too big because we also have proofs for analysis. So I'll put here mathematical induction. Now, uh, statistics, there is statistics, but statistics, statistics minus probability theory is really easy. Statistics without the probability theory parts 
you only need arithmetic for that. So measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, or measures of uh, dispersion, like calculating variance, standard deviation. You only need uh, arithmetic for that stuff. So I won't put stats here. Then uh, what else do we need for probability? I mean, this is a, the, the, the really big ones. And analysis is humongous, but the main parts are limits, sequences, and series, differentiation, 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 and integration. Integration. These two are quite big. And integration, especially so, mm, uh, a number of people in the other workshops talked about, you know, stochastic calculus because they wanted to specialize in financial mathematics. Uh, so, uh, yeah, integration can, there are many variations of, of integration that can get elaborate. Uh, there is one type, and then we have uh, differential equations. Differential equations, I will put, yeah, I'll put that into a different category, but differential equations have another prerequisite, have another prerequisite, which includes complex variables. And complex variables have another prerequisite, and, that I'll, and I'll just stop at trigonometry. Trigonometry. Trigo. Now, look at this uh, list. It's as if you have to have a, um, like a degree in mathematics to be good at machine learning. Right? Uh, kind of may might look intimidating to some of you. So how do I, how would I order this? If you were to re study this sequentially, how would you order it? I would do it this way. I would put discrete mathematics at the very top. So let me create a separate panel. And then I'll tell you where you can go to learn this. Okay, so bear with me. I will put discrete mathematics at the very top. How do flat earthers <laughs> spell trigonometry? They don't. They don't have to, right? If only they knew, if they, if they knew some, uh, you know, discrete math, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But anyway, discrete mathematics, I will put at the top and I would put set theory at the top here. Now, set theory is, uh... no, no, let me, let, me, let me say this before I come back to what I was trying to say. Let me just finish this. So we have discrete math. Then I will put linear algebra. And then I will put analysis. So effectively, I am turning this thing on its head. Discrete mathematics. No, again, I was about to make a point. So you know why mathematics is hard to learn? Okay, and I say this as someone who really struggled in school with mathematics. So I had to try different ways to finally become good at mathematics, like, and I had to learn independently. But I've learned that there are two obstacles in learning mathematics. One of them is the symbols. The second obstacle is the terminology. Terminology. You see, some people have different definitions for mathematics, but one definition that I'll give you, and I've heard other people who are far more knowledgeable than I am, give the same definition. That the mathematics is a language. More specifically, mathematics is the language of precision. So right now I'm speaking to you in English, and which is one spoken language, and there are other spoken languages, but these languages are not precise. If I wanna tell you how big something is, without using units of measurement, I would have to use approximation. So I can say it's as big as my head or it's as small as my smartphone, but I'm not precise. Mathematics is a language of precision. What does that mean? 
It means just like English or Mandarin or French or Sinhalese, whatever language, it has its own alphabet, its own vocabulary, and its own grammar. So anyone can learn one of these other spoken languages because you can transfer your skills to learn another language. So if you know vocabulary and grammar rules in English, you can, you can uh, apply your knowledge of combining words together to learn another foreign language. And everyone does this from babies to you know very elderly people. The same is true for math. You can learn math just as well you can learn a sp spoken language. So long as you pivot or you put your focus on the symbols. If you prioritize knowing the meanings of, you know, different symbols in mathematics, then you can read a mathematical expression like it is in English phrase or whatever your mother tongue is. Okay. What I would used to do, and I suppose it's also true for others, is when they see a symbol, they try, I don't know, they get overwhelmed by the entirety. What, is, what I like to do is if I see a mathematical expression, if I come back to this paper, if I see something like this one, okay, I'm not going to do anything else until I'm absolutely sure I know what this one is, like what it means. It turns out this one is what we call an indicator function. And if I, it's a function that will give you the one or zero. So until I have absolutely established what this, the meaning of this one particular symbol is, I zoomed in too much. I won't go any further. And then we have, for example, uh, dot equal. Anyone know what this dot equal means, uh, this colon equal? The colon equal means that this is being reassigned again and again. Okay? Now, the good thing is if you know these symbols, if you if you try to learn the symbols once, you will see the symbols again and again and again. And you it will become just a lot faster for you to uh, read mathematics than ever if you just focus on knowing what these symbols mean. I have on my shelf uh, a table of symbols that tells me what that symbol stands for and how I can write it in LaTeX. I take it with me everywhere. And you can find these are for free on Wikipedia. And print it out. And then there's terminology. You know that uh, one, one problem in mathematics, and it's, this is especially true in statistics, is that uh, they use words that are used in normal everyday English, but they mean very different things. So for example, the word space has a very specific meaning in mathematics versus English. Or mathematicians use different words to refer to the same thing. I don't, I don't know if you caught it earlier, but I talked about the objective function. Another name, another synonym for objective function is cost function. So let's say you already know what an objective function, but then you come across a cost function. And you go, wait a minute, what does this even mean? So if you're not familiar with that, the fact that these two words refer to the same exact thing, again, you will, uh, you know, you will face an obstacle. So what I like to do all the time when I'm reading any sort of math mathematical literature is to make sure that I first catch any jargon and I know the definition for it. And of course, uh, that I make a note of all of the mathematical expressions. So I have a table that looks like this, this one, right? All the uh, mathematical expressions, all the variables, I have, and if there's any jargon that I have to look up, I make a list of that. Now, coming back to that table. So knowing that, uh, having said that symbols are a big obstacle to learning mathematics, how do you go about well, learning these symbols? My suggestion is to start with discrete mathematics and specifically set theory. This is if you have no exposure or if you forgot much of the mathematics you learned. Why discrete mathematics? Because discrete mathematics, unlike the other branches of mathematics that I've listed here, have the discrete mathematics has no prerequisite knowledge. It does not assume any knowledge. In fact, unlike probability theory or calculus, where you have to have multiple books to make sense of the idea, discrete mathematics, one book is suffice. One book will suffice. It, 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 there is no arithmetic involved. 
And I mean, it's self-contained. You can pick up, a, there are a very handful of very popular discrete mathematics books. If you go to Amazon, type in discrete mathematics, uh, you will get a bunch of them. So you can buy this one book and learn discrete mathematics. Now, why is it great? Discrete mathematics will introduce you to the symbols of mathematics. You will, be, you will know the alphabet, in other words. Once you know the alphabet, you will then be able to breeze past pages in something like linear algebra. For example, abstract algebra extends elementary algebra. And the elementary algebra is about uh, variables, con constants, and radicals. Okay? Abstract algebra takes the idea of sets, which are covered extensively in discrete mathematics, and creates variations of sets. So we have things like fields, rings, groups. These are all sets. And if you pick up a book on abstract algebra, it's page after page about sets and different rules that apply to sets. All of these things are covered in discrete mathematics. And then there is a niche area of abstract algebra called linear algebra. Once again, linear algebra is like if you want to learn like high level linear algebra properly to make sense of things like PCA and SVM or even the TSNE to which we refer today, you will have you will have to be familiar with sets and the variations of sets to get past like to to read it. And then once you've learned, uh, and you can no actually no, you don't have to learn linear algebra and uh, analysis. In order, we can learn them in parallel. So, for example, you you want to start with limits and sequences and series. This is a good starting point. Okay, again, limits, sequences, series, and again, this doesn't have prerequisites. This is single variable calculus. This is taught in every college course and sometimes high school. Um, but then uh, once you get to multi, and then there is calculus two, which is uh, still using differentiation. Uh, an integration of, you know, one variable. But then once you get to multivariate calculus, now by, by the way, multivariate calculus, which I will put, uh, where should I put multivariate calculus? Multivariate calculus. Okay, let's put it here. Multivariate calculus, right? It comes after single variable calculus, but before differential equations. So for example, if you want to understand how neural networks work, there is this thing called gradient descent. Uh, and your knowledge of, and since neural networks are actually matrices in practice, you need to know matrices and differentiation, differentiating those, the vectors or the matrices. That's the topic of multivariate calculus. And multivariate calculus goes by another name, vector, calculus, or more, more broadly speaking, vector analysis. Why is it called vector calculus? Because like I said, it is differentiation integration on vectors. That's multivariate calculus. But again, if you have you studied linear algebra, and if you want to breeze past linear algebra, you would have to know some set theory. Uh, this is why I would suggest a sequence. Once you know multivariate calculus, then you would have been exposed to partial differentiation which is what differential, differential equations are about. But then there are some topics in differential equations like the Fourier transform and other types of transforms. By the way, integration and differentiation, these are both what we call transforms. These are both transforms, okay? So if any of you have, have studied engineering, you, have, you, are, you, you for sure have heard of words like uh, uh, differential, uh, Transforms. So machine learning has a machine in the field of machine learning where you have a lot of signal processing, which is an engineering discipline, and you know in, that engineers learn. And if you want to be a good, if you want to uh, learn the mathematics that engineers know for your machine learning applications, well, then you have to also be exposed to differential equations. And differential equations in turn use complex variables. Now complex variables involve uh, planes. So one central component in complex variables are the complex, is the complex plane. 
And if you want to understand operations in planes, that's just trigonometry. And trigonometry shouldn't be a problem uh, if you know some, if you know the, uh, what do you call it? The ratios. And then I would say the prerequisite for trigonometry is just geometry. Okay, but the, uh, in this elementary geometry, there's also a more sophisticated form of geometry. Valentin references a book called The Princeton Companion to Mathematics, which I absolutely love. It is a book that introduces you to, I, I can't say all, but so many of the branches of mathematics. And they give you context. Like there are some books that just, that is meant for studying, like for course, for classwork. But they don't tell you where you would use these uh, techniques. So right now, I've given you some context. I'm telling you why you will learn why you need to learn abstract algebra. I'm telling you why you would want to learn complex variables or trigonometry. So you have a reason. But those books, you know, they won't tell you why. But the Princeton Companion to Mathematics. Let me open the link here. This book, you know, is a great survey of different branches of mathematics. They give, it gives you historical context and gives you examples of applications. It's just that, you know, it's a nice, it's just a pleasure to read, to read this book. Now, we only have one more minute, so let me, let me just finish uh, with an important point. Discrete mathematics, right? So this is what you want to start learning first, which brings me to the big number website. So last week at big number, we finished a course a three-week course math called Mathematics and Programming. Mathematics and Programming is uh, a course that teaches you discrete mathematics, really, with Python. So even if you don't know Python, which I believe most of you do, it, it there is a self-paced Python tutorial. And then in order for you to understand stuff like sets and graphs, like binary trees, you know, binary trees are a big deal in computer science. Binary trees are types of graphs. So if you want to know what these are and be able to like mathematically formulate them, this course covers it. Now, since the course is over, it is now self-paced. So we won't cover it in the live sessions like we are doing it here, but the tutorials are there. Um, the I just showed you the website here. Exercise files, slides, PDF tutorials, they're all there. And if you want to like even get certified, you can all you have to do is finish the assignments. Next week, there's another course that starts, 27th of June. And that is linear mathematics. This course is about linear algebra and linear programming. Very important in machine learning uh, and even other fields like economics and logistics. So if you want to, if you're new to mathematics, if you want a good start, I suggest you take this course because uh, uh, I mean, uh, I understand what it's like for a new person to enter the field. So have a look at the have a look at it. You can just sign up with your email and start learning. There's nothing complicated. And then check out this uh, check out the material for linear mathematics. So if you want a good mathematical foundation for neural networks for matrix theory, then this is one place you can go. Plus, you have we have live interaction. Also, uh, the Slack channel. I suggest you join the Slack channel so that. You know, if you have any questions about this or uh, the dashboard or any, you know, anything in general, you have a place where like-minded people, you can have discussions with like-minded people. Okay, and the link is in Meetup. Another reference from Sh uh, Ron, a book from O'Reilly. Yes, this book is very nice, by the way. You know, uh, and the, let me just also add this, right? If, it, if you prefer books, and I highly recommend that you read books if you want uh, to learn quickly, as opposed to videos, the fo let me just tell you this following public publishers. For practical learning, like programming and technical implementation, O'Reilly, hands down. They have excellent books uh, for like on PyTorch, TensorFlow, like the book to which Ron is referring, which is this one. I I have one. I have this on on my shelf, on my shelf. Uh, it's an excellent book. 
So if you're new to any of this, I highly recommend it. The hands-on machine learning. Okay. So for practical O'Reilly, for more mathematically oriented people, there is Cambridge University. Cambridge University is as a large collection of books from mathematics to machine learning. There is, if you if you want statistics, the best publisher on statistics specifically is well, it's called from it's from Routledge. Texts on statistics, something to that effect. Uh, but then there is Springer. And then there's also MIT Press. So you want to go in that order. For theory, these are the publishers you want to look at. And for practical applications, O'Reilly. Nothing really comes close to O'Reilly under this criteria. And Raj says, if you dare, MIT Open Course were on YouTube is awesome. Uh, the MIT lectures, of course, are first class. I mean, everybody was MIT, but uh, you, you do need book to, books to accommodate your learning, okay? Because uh, in video, you know, like when the professor is talking, they assume you already know the prerequisites. Uh, I'm going to post these. Like I said, when you come back tomorrow, you will find a new course listed here for the ML papers. Open source, yeah, you don't have to sign up. The videos will be there. The material that I shared here, this list, for example, will be there. The reading material that I recommend will be there. Some of the videos with other courses will be there. So, you know, I look forward to you, to you uh, signing up to the website. So do actually do that now, sign up now and uh, make make use of this material. But that's it for today. If you do have any questions, I know I didn't really, we didn't, uh, I didn't leave any window for questions, but if you do have questions, I invite you to join our Slack channel. And thank you so much, Iqbal. Yes, the slides will be available here, the recording and the course, the dashboard will be available tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Ask a question. Sorry, can yeah, you go ahead. can you post that uh, that um uh, list? Website? Of, no, not the website. The uh, um, markup that you wrote for the map structure. Yes, yes, yes. I'll post this on the. I'll post it on the website. Okay. So, okay. I'll even put it here in the Slack. So join the Slack channel. If you go to if you if you go to Meetup or your RSVP, the link to Slack is the, the the link to Slack is there. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, you attending. I'll see you in the next episode. For now, take care and bye-bye.